It is the tradition of the ancient church to bless one another at the beginning of the time of worship. And so in response to my saying, the Lord be with you, if you will respond and also with you. The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship at St. Andrew's Baptist Church. God has gathered us together today. God has invited us into this place, and we are responding with our bodies in presence, not only in this room, but also throughout electronic means to join together and worship God today. We rejoice to worship to answer the call of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Pray with me, please. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You have gathered us to worship today, O oh Lord, and we lift our hearts and our minds to you. Whether we come in joy or in sorrow, we know you have promised you are with us, O oh God. And we are grateful for your presence in our lives. We pray all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. I invite you to get your hymnal and turn to number 310, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. You may rise in body or in spirit as we sing together, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
Are y'all happy this morning? Are you fill up, filled with joy? Well, today we're going to be talking about happiness and joy, so y'all are the experts. So what makes you happy? Getting stuff, that makes me happy. Make sure you tell Mr. William. Okay, what, what makes you happy? Does ice cream make anybody happy? Because it certainly makes me happy. I do too. Well, you know, in the baby room, you know what makes them happy there? Bubbles. Oh, yes. Doesn't that make us happy? But do the bubbles last? What happens? They pop. Some last a little bit longer than others. But that's kind of like our happiness, isn't it? Our happiness. We're not always happy, are we? Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. That's sometimes. But you know, so we're talking about joy. Now, joy is kind of like a, a deeper happy. It's a happy that's deep in us, and we always can be joyful, even if we're not happy like Oliver is right now. So the Bible tells us, though, in Psalms, now is that in the Old or the New Testament? It's in the Old Testament, almost, but it's over here. If I'd have shown you this, you would have known, Juliana. But it's in Psalms, in chapter 16, verse 10 and 11, it says, You make known to me the path of life. So you, who's that talking about? God makes known to us the path of life, and you fill me with joy in your presence. So the Bible tells us, that God fills us with joy when we're in his presence. How can we be in his presence? Coming to church, talking to God, praying, reading the Bible. Absolutely. So all these can help us be in his presence. Now, when I was your age, we sang a song, and it helped me know what joy was. And it, it even made me happy when I sang it. And I think some of our members know this song. Can y'all sing it with me? It's, I've got the joy, joy, joy. Ready? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I have the love of Jesus in my heart, and I'm so happy, so very happy. I have the love of Jesus in my heart. Oh, yes, very good, very good. So the love of Jesus in our heart can fill us with joy to overflowing. Now, when we're overflowing, I want y'all to picture, like, when you go to pour yourself a drink and it just spills out over the top, that's overflowing. So if I have the love of Jesus in my heart and I'm full of joy, I want to share that with other people, right? You know, if I'm playing with bubbles and I'm having fun and I'm happy, I'm going to share that with the babies. I'm going to share that with you guys up here. And so we all can be happy. So we need to share with people you know what? Jesus loves you, and Jesus loves you, and Jesus loves even you. Isn't that awesome? And he loves me. Yeah. And so that makes me happy, and that fills us with joy, because the Bible tells me so. That's right. The Bible tells us that in his presence we can have joy. Will y'all pray with me? Dear God, I just thank you for all my friends and that we're learning more about you each and every day. I pray you would fill us with joy to overflowing to where we would share with all of those that we know the reason for our joy is that we love you and we know you and that Jesus loves them. Amen. All right. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> One of the verses I like to go to many times that help me get peace in my life is found in Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. We can never avoid strife in the world around us, but when we fix our thoughts on God, we can know perfect peace even in turmoil. As we focus our mind on God and his word, we become steady and stable. Supported by God's unchanging love and mighty power, we are not shaken by the surrounding chaos. Do you want peace? Keep your thoughts on God and your trust in him. So let's think about the Lord. What's it about? What's his character like? Well, let's review. Jehovah Yahweh, the existing one and the great I am. Elohim, the one who is infinite in power and absolutely faithful to keep his promises to you. El Shaddai, the almighty God, the most high over all, who is always victorious. Jehovah Jireh, your perfect provider, who perceives your needs and faithfully supplies what will fulfill them. Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals you both inside and out. You see, your gigantic troubles will shrink in comparison to your great and mighty God. In the light of his presence and power, nothing will be impossible for you. Shall we pray? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, help us always to remember who you are and your character, Lord, as I just spoke about. Help us, Lord, always to know that in the, we can have peace in the midst of the storm. We, we don't have to worry about the circumstances around us, Lord. You've proven that over and over again in your word and all the stories in the Bible that you told us about. Help us, Lord, to remember those and keep the, the word of God close to our heart and we can have peace at all times. Lord, I pray you bless this offering and the giver, and please continue, Lord, to bless St. Andrew's Baptist Church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Help me now, thy grace. 
Thank you. Beautiful music. And thank you, congregation, for your welcome today. My name is Elizabeth Nance Coker, and I'm the newly installed coordinator for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of South Carolina. CBF South Carolina has been blessed and well led by my predecessors, Marian Aldridge and Jay Keevy, and I'm very happy and proud to be next in line. They have created and curated an organization which values relationships with our churches, serving together in partnership. We say for our mission statement that we are women and men participating in God's mission together. We nurture spiritual development, encourage congregations to thrive, and value collaborative and innovative ministry and missions. From the very beginning of Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, we have held firmly to four historical Baptist distinctive principles. The autonomous local church, ordaining men and women whom God's spirit has called into ministry. The priesthood of the believer to work and study and learn individually and to minister to one another. The interpretation of scripture is God's word through the lens of the person and work of Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate word of God, and religious liberty for all people. So I'm very proud that the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship continues to build our faithful work on these historic Baptist principles from so long ago as we share the good news with this world that God so loves. Our CBF South Carolina vision statement says, we are growing as a community of grace on a shared spiritual journey that connects people to Christ and one another. And so we see the ways that God is working to invite and equip and transform lives. We are thankful. I'm thankful for you, St. Andrews Baptist, for your partnership with us for sending great people to serve on our council. Through the years, you've been a big part of what we do, and I'm thankful to be here with you in your house today, worshiping. I invite you to turn in your Bible to the book of Psalms, chapter 119. You'll find that pretty much right smack dab in the middle of your Bible, and I invite you to turn to Psalm 119. We'll be beginning with verse 105. As you're turning, here's some interesting information about Psalm 119. It is the longest chapter in the entire Bible, 176 verses. No one ever memorized this one in training union back in the day. We picked the shorter ones, but now it's become a part of our heart language. Not only is it the longest chapter, but it's also the most carefully structured. It's written in the original Hebrew as an acrostic poem. So there are 22 stanzas, and each of those stanzas begin with a sequential letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So each of the 22 stanzas contains eight verses, and the first letter of each of those eight verses begin with the same particular letter of the alphabet. So for example, the first section, has eight verses, and each one of those in the Hebrew begin with the letter Aleph, like our A. Second section, eight verses, each one begins with Beth, like our letter B, and so forth. So today we're reading the 16th portion of those scriptures, and it begins, if we were reading in Hebrew, with the letter Nun, which is like our N. Today I join my voice with the ancient praise of all God's people, reading from Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112 in the book we love. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord. Teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. 
The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. We hear God speak through the reading of these words. Thanks be to God. The book of Psalms is many, many things. A hymn book, a prayer book, an instruction book. At different times in our lives, we experience these facets of this book in different ways. Fragments of psalms are found all throughout the Bible. You may remember the prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. All across the ages of time and space and even geography, people have learned and memorized the psalms as part of their daily living, their lifelong learning, their continued formation in, in faith, especially in worship together. I know of people who live in countries where it is not legal to gather as a worshiping body who share the psalms and memorize them and share them with one another as they pass throughout the day in the marketplace, in the school. It becomes a 24-7 feast of worship to know the psalms. For hundreds of years, and still today, people start their meals with a prayer from Psalm 145. The eyes of all look upon thee, and thou givest them their food in due season. Thou openest thine hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. Here in the Psalter, the book of Psalms, we meet the full range of human emotions. Poems of praise, thanksgiving, and almost half of lament. The human condition is well represented here. Do you know what that tells me? That tells me that it is okay to bring my whole self to God, that I do not have to put on my game face in prayer, that God has me and you and the whole world in mind, long ago had us in mind when these psalmists crafted these prayers and these hymns. Thanks be to God. What a gift. Worship tells God's story. So when we gather for worship, we learn from the biblical testimony about what God has been doing throughout human history. In this section of Psalm 119, the psalmist is offering praise to God for the instruction that God provides about how to relate to God and how to relate to others and in general how to survive life with joy. The teachings then received from the written tradition, often called the law, you may have heard it called the Torah, the first five books of what we have as the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, would have also included the oral tradition at the time, teachings passed down from teacher to student to teacher to student, coming from wise teachers and interpreters, maybe other sacred books that had already been written as scrolls at the time, and even from the witness of the natural law that's present in the created order, evidence of the work of the creator. So as we walk through these eight verses together this morning, I invite you to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest this beautiful prayer, applying it to your life, bringing joy to your heart. Further, I hope you will continue during this week to study this psalm, prayerfully asking God to work these words into your heart. In verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We join the ancient praise of all God's people when we praise God with these words, reflecting upon the light that God provides for our path in life. 
What does that look like? God helps us make wise decisions. God helps us to decide what is the best way to behave as a human, how to use our resources, how to treat others. If we were to play that word association game and I would be to say Old Testament law, what would be your first response? Most of us jump to the Ten Commandments. Or, you know, on a really heady day, we might say Leviticus, but Old Testament law to us, the Ten Commandments, the commandments that were set out to establish with the covenant people of Israel God's way of relating not only to God, but also to people. But what if I said New Testament commandments? And we think, hmm, your mind might take you to Jesus' teaching, found among other places in Mark chapter 12. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It turns out that following Christ is a little bit like the hokey pokey. You have to put your whole self in not just the arm or the leg, the whole self. That's what Jesus is saying. And your whole self, not just for you, not just because you love Jesus, because you love your neighbor too. If we look further into the historical chronology of the person and work of Jesus Christ, we look at the Last Supper when Jesus sat with his disciples, giving them final instructions on how to be disciples, how to be learners, how to be followers of this way. And in John chapter 13, he said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And then the proof, he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. I've been asked if we have a statement of faith or a creed, and my response is, as followers of Christ, our baptismal confession is, Jesus is Lord. Our oath is, is to follow Jesus in full commitment of heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, if you're reading further down into the psalm, then you see the problem. Verse 107, I am severely afflicted. This is a little lament fragment in the middle of a praise psalm. But we're going to figure that out. Life happens in very non-joyous ways. Severe afflictions, life-threatening circumstances, wicked people who are bent upon destruction. For us, worldwide pandemic, daily mass shootings, wars, sometimes even hurricanes. But in the original context, in the location, in time, in history, when this passage was composed, scholars say this was probably written during the time of exile. So you may remember, not from your own personal being there, but through your study of the Bible, in 586 BCE, Jerusalem was attacked. It was burned and it was ruined by the Babylonians. The temple was destroyed. The military was slaughtered. The king was blinded and taken away in chains. The brightest and best of the city were forced marched along with their families, including very young children, to a distant land. And they were held there for 70 years. So in a time of exile, those people you may recall from Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon, 
we hung up our harps and wept. They had lost what was meaningful to them except their lives and one another. So this psalmist, far away from Jerusalem, far away, no temple, no place to offer sacrifice, which was the basis of their worship at that time. No place to bring offerings to God. Obstacles and afflictions caused the psalmist to dig deeply into their heart, to think deeply with their mind, to realize that because he traveled this dark road of isolation, he needed the light of God's instruction even more, and that is the rope that he is clinging to here. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there today. Don't let go. You can trust God to be that lamp and that light. This person in this psalm had no way to follow that tradition of the physical sacrifice to God. And so it became the custom of the Israelites who were in exile to speak an offering of praise. It was called literally the first offering of the mouth. They would continue offering praise to God as the verbal equivalent of the gift of sacrifice they would have given had there been a temple and an offering place. They found joy through remembering who they were. In the middle of these challenging circumstances, they leaned in and listened to God, remembered what they had been taught, remembered what they shared, and when they listened, they heard God reminding them, as Frederick Buechner says, the worst word is not the last word. They were reminded of God's instruction. They were reminded of their grounding in the faith. These were reminders of who God is, present with them from generation to generation. Even in the place of Babylon, God was there with them. The joy of their heart was recreated when they remembered who they were because they remembered who God was. And then they were able to live into this truth. The truth that they and each and every person were created in the image of God. Each person, a beloved child of God, not defined by being a captive in a foreign place, defined by the Creator. They were capable people of bringing a sacrifice of praise, a hallelujah anyway, to God. When we look at the testimony of Christ, we hear him teaching his followers how to live during an occupation, a Roman Empire occupation of their land. It applies in many ways to our world today. All around the globe there are places of such challenge. Jesus teaches us the followers of Christ, to be the people who help other people find their joy, to experience the love of God. Jesus gives us the joy of loving our neighbors, caring for widows and orphans, he says, showing hospitality to others and making room at the table. When we're thinking about the psalmist who was so grateful to know and follow the teaching of God, the word. 
We also think about the words of Christ who says, learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. The piety of the psalmist, their sense of holy following is expressed in this deep commitment to God's instruction. It's ongoing, it's a continuing thing. It's the piety of the Christ follower who responds faithfully to what Jesus asked the followers to do. Not a tunnel vision, narrow, legalistic, one and done, but an unwavering trust in God, in God's presence, abiding in a steady commitment to following. This is transformative. It takes us where we are and lets us lean in, learn in, and follow in into newness of life. Pastor Eugene Peterson expressed this idea beautifully in his translation called The Message. In Matthew chapter 11, he's paraphrasing what Jesus said, inviting disciples to learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. As a musician, sometimes we get excited, especially when we're learning a new piece and it's got an up-tempo. We just, oh man, we're pounding through it and it's so much fun. It's loud and fast. And we have to discipline ourselves to do what you heard the choir beautifully do this morning. Take a text at a tempo where we can process the words where the melody lends itself to us receiving gracious spirit dwell with me. The unforced rhythms of grace. So the invitation from Jesus is to embrace his teaching, to treasure his example, to join him in this work celebrating the lamp to our feet, the light to our path, the joy of our heart. Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So my words today to you, put your whole self in to this journey with Christ. Find the joy of your heart. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Please join me in prayer. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Our loving, liberating, life-giving God, we give thanks for the word of God which we have explored together this morning. May it burn in our minds, our wills, and our feelings. 
as we sense the light and heat of your presence in that word through Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate word, and by the presence of your spirit, who enlightens us to hear your instructions fresh each day. Help us to listen. Move us to understanding. Help us to believe this good news and give us the strength and wisdom to live by it. We pray in the holy name of Jesus Christ, who together with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 281, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. We'll be singing together stanzas one through three. I'll be in the front if you have a decision or need prayer. Please come forward. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together. As you go into the world this week to be salt and light, 
to this world God loves. Hear now the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.